your uh, your bishop in prayer at all times. Um, his his uh, uh, he was telling me a little bit about the you know him possibly having the flu, um, and I I, I I was texting him back and forth throughout work throughout the day and telling him all right, make sure you take some medicine. And um, the flu can be a, a serious thing, um, but praise God, he's exercising wisdom. Um, I've been in contact with his family and stuff. So I say that pastor, the leaders that we have in our church. Every, you never know what people are going through. You never know. You, you'd be like, what? What happened? Um, there was a dear a young lady, seven-year-old, that um, Brother Ryan told me about who has cancer. So that, you know, that was another thing. I heard that, and and I can't help but to, like I just shared with y'all, sometimes you're like, man, this planet is, you know, Brutal. bad, 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 right? And then I'm reminded I was sharing with him. I, faith started speaking back to him because I said, well, what's our answer, right? We understand that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then we go into Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 3. We see the fall of man, right? So we, we have a narrative. The atheists don't. They do not. Um, Big Bang, cosmology, from, cos from an accident, random, um, because, uh, why did the universe, why did all, how did all matter get here? No explanation. But yet they guise it under um, so-called pseudo-intelligence, amen? We at least can point to a God that we, and, and they may call God whatever, and, and, and that's why I was sharing with y'all before, be on guard because people will shape, the, one of the oldest sins in the book is called idolatry. It's to create a God to suit yourself. So their God, of course, has to be weak. Um, he allows sin. I, I tell people, like, he's not allowing sin, but if, be careful about your request. Because if you're asking God to judge sin, then this whole planet, right? God don't just judge a little sin. He judges all, all sin. sin. So guess what? You better be glad that he is holding back his hand. He has his hand on the volume. Amen. You know, people say, you know, um, God is going, he's coming, he's coming. Here we go. And, and, and God is like, I'm patient. We see that throughout all history. I love the word of God because whenever I remember going through my life and going, man, I could have died and went to hell so many times. I wasn't, I didn't know him. And that just shows you his mercy. It shows you his kindness. And it should make you rejoice. We need to be reminded, saints. It's an act, our faith is active. Actively being reminded. Because you can't rely on yesteryears. You can't say, I remember when I was on fire. I've seen so many Christians that they told me, ah, I used to serve. And Bishop talks about this all the time. And I'm like, hey, you do understand you don't get points for yesterday. God is looking at the here and now. Yeah. When I minister to even people that do some pretty uh, heinous things, I tell them, I'm like, hey, and this is my way of sneaking in the gospel. I'm like, it ain't about what you did. You can't, you can't fix that. Let, let's fix it today. And, and, and they're tender. Their hearts are tender. They're ready. They're prepared. Amen. And that's one of the things that I've been on this mission about with the church. My desire has been the church, understanding that church formation according to Christ, not a plan, not a book. I've, I've read the books, read some of the books, good insights. Some of them, those scriptures in there, here and there, and a little scripture, a little bit, you know, and then also here's a plan. We got this from the world. We're going to mix it in with the Bible. I don't, I don't like the muddy mixture. What's the word tell us? And most importantly, the Holy Spirit told me, what does the one who created everything tell us? It's amazing that we take for granted, just like marriage, just like church, we always assume that everybody, you're saved and you know what it means to be a part of a church. You know what it means to be a disciple. And, and sad to say, and I, I've been guilty of it, I was like, okay, salvation, check. I go to a church, check, right? I know the pastor, check, right? But the question was, do I know Jesus? Do I know his will? Do I know his uh, mark? Amen. And thank God. I, I, you know, I, I always say, Lord, I, I could have been in any other church. We could have been in some false teacher's church and hooping and howling, doing all that. But God drew me by his sovereign grace to foods of a will where there was teaching. Bishop, there was a, a, a point where, it, that yes, people would come and then people would leave. And I said, because the, pe the preaching is coming in hot, right? The, the, the heat of God's word against sin. Amen. When, when, when the heart, when the sinful heart is, is examined by the word of God, the Bible says the word of God is a lamp unto our feet. And we go, oh, that's a nice statement. And I'm like, no, he's saying that in a dark environment, and imagine a dark environment, and you got a flashlight. That flashlight, man, is the brightest thing. It is the thing that is keeping you on your path. Amen. And oftentimes we, we tend to 
play light and loose with the things that are spiritual instead of focusing on the main thing. I mean, we're going to make it about the main thing here at Behoose of Will. It's always been about Jesus. Tonight, my message is going to be talking about following the vision of Christ, submitting to the, the vision of Christ. Do I submit to the vision of Christ? Now, why are you mentioning that, Pastor Goodsby? Because in light of, remember, all preaching, is a, there's always a compare and contrast. When you share the gospel, right, you share the good news and, if you're doing it faithfully, and the bad news. Because the good news don't seem like good news because if I'm a sinner and you come and say, hey, you want to go to church and you want to go to heaven, and they may accept the heaven. They may accept, I'm, you know, I, I'm good, I'm a good person. But they don't understand their position and their desperate needs. Saints, can I say that again? Desperate needs of a savior. And we have to re be reminded ourselves, like, where were we at? And that's why I always tell you, use your testimony. It's not, I'm not talking, I'm not talking about your exploits. I've seen Christians do that where I'd be like, okay, censor that. Um, I'm talking about, because you can talk about things without going into details. You can say, oh no. I, lo I love hearing men and, and women that said, hey, I was, you know, I was up on charges for murder. I went to jail, did 10 years, 15 years, and they're out ministering. And I'm look, I'm saying, I, my eyes are like, why? Because for God to take somebody, can you imagine the condemnation that's on, on them? You're not right. You took somebody's life. And yes, even in within the church, we would judge. And I'm not saying not to be cautious. Yes, we're going to be cautious. We, we should be that way with everyone, right? But more importantly, I'm impressed. I'm impressed, and I look up, and I go, wow. I share the story oftentimes when working at the PD, and then somebody came in for a report, and the guy was really humble, a uh, young African-American man. He comes in. And he, you know, looks kind of cool and all that. He said, hey, uh, we used to do fingerprints for people for a uh, job, at, uh, for a particular job. Like if it's a high-end job, they want to do your fingerprints and they want to know if you what you've been a part of. So I'm doing, I'm like, yeah, hold on, I was busy, tired. And then, you know, his testimony just, I, I was like literally tearing up listening to his testimony. I'm sitting at my desk going, my friend that was sitting there, we all gone. I said, that's the power of God unto salvation. I've uh, gotten in trouble with the law. He, he, like he said, he brought, did armed robbery with somebody, with some cats. And the whole story was repentance. I, I thought of the prodigal son. I said, this man is ministering to us and not even knowing. He says, hey, if you pull my name up, you probably won't see some things. He started off with that. And I said, oh, don't worry about it. You know, everybody, everybody get in trouble. He said, no, no, no. I was in federal prison. And I was, and I was like, whoa. So he goes and tells me this testimony. That's why I said the testimonies are powerful because it's a wonderful way to, to boomerang and certainly navigate people's conscience, right? To get around, because they want to argue. They want to go, there's no God. I know there's no God. My friend told me there was no God. Bill Maher said that there's no God. The late night talk show said that there's no God. God is faith. Christians are feeble-minded. Um, so they, they want to argue, but his testimony, I was sitting there, and I'm telling no lie, I'm sitting there tearing up listening to this man's testimony. I'm a police officer. I'm wearing my, my uniform, and he's ministering to us and just reminding me. I was like, God, you are awesome. Gets in trouble, gets out of prison, said he was depressed. He was about to get back into the game. People was trying to, soon as he got out, people was like, yeah, man, come on, let's go. And he said that couldn't find any jobs. Everybody kept telling him, nah, you can't, you, you, you can't, oh, you got that on your record? And he, uh, so long story short, he just, he kept doing that. Then he started, uh, he met a, a female that took her to church. Um, and he said, he started, God was like, hey, I'm going I'm to rebuild you. And so he, he came up with this term called redesigning himself. So he went back to school because he said nobody was taking felon. That people were like, nope. And then God told him, no, tell them in advance. Tell them in advance where you came from. Tell them in advance. Why they, before they can say no, right? And this job is a was a GS level job, four hood level job. He put it out on the paper. He said, I can explain. He said, I got into trouble, I was young, da da da. He started doing that. So this company hired him. He went to CTC, did um, uh, just basic um, welding. Because he said, no, you know, he needed a skill. That was part of God telling him to re, uh, reinvent yourself. Stop, stop thinking the same way. Nobody, nobody's hiring me. I'm about, I'm about to put a mask on and go back out and do get back into the game, right? Start robbing folks, hitting lips. That's what he was saying. So he said that was his temptation. One, God told him to get away from people. So he said I was friendly, I was nice to people, but I was like, yeah, y'all know I just spent 15 years. So he, he had a good excuse. So he goes and does it. He does. Um, he told us he did. Um, and this is amazing. He did welding, just basic welding. 
Then he did. He was working for a guy. He's I was making some good money. Then another guy said like, Hey, have you ever thought about being an electronic welder? Because they make more money. Then he goes and get, does school, and then he goes for this military four hood job that they federal government are you know they're pretty strict. He gets goes there. To, the guy's like, Okay, well, so all right. And he said he tells his testimony. It was three people on the thing. They were all going, they were all sad, going, Wow, look at you now, right? Humility. I saw humility. I didn't see pride. I wasn't like, yeah, I'm back in the game again. I'm, you know, it was humility. And I thought that was powerful. And it showed me something. I said, people run from their past. And there's a way for you to be able to show the greatness and the grandness of our God by him being able to redeem a, a sinner. Like, in the world, we judge people. We look, I didn't, I didn't rob anybody, so I'm better than him, right? But in God's eye, one sin is enough to send you to hell. And so he, in his humility, showed that, hey, I humbled myself. I had to redefine myself. I stopped using excuses. He said, bro, I was doing the same thing. My friends were like, yeah, it's hard to find jobs, bro. We need to go, go back to, to the old ways. And he did a couple of things. And so it, it was a powerful testimony. Literally, I'm like speechless. I'm fingerprinting him, you know, get, so he can get his cards, and then they can send him off. They already knew his thing. He said, guess what? The, the guy was like, I'm glad you told us. And then. And then he said he got called, and then they said, hey, you got the job. And he says, I'm not supposed to have this job. It's a disqualifier, but he had the job. And I look back on my life. I look at how I'm least qualified. Not every job, there was three jobs that I got, and I'm not going to go into that. But just showing you the power of God, if you humble yourself, little old me, Lord, what am I going to do in life, right? And God says, watch this, if you humble yourself. So tonight, as we humble ourselves to come in to eat at the table of God's table to hear the word of God, we're going to talk about some of the things, you know, in, in preaching, there's always the problem and then the solution, right? We understand that there's challenges that the church are, is facing. I was talking about that earlier. There are, if we're sensitive enough to understand, there are pressures that, that we all are feeling. There are pressures internal, there are pressures outside of us, amen, even within the church, um, I, I, I sense from Bishop, he didn't say anything, but I sense from him what's going to happen with the church. His, his lovely, lovely wife of years, 50 plus years, has gone on to be with the Lord, and he's moving through. And even there, there's his own struggles and his, his health and all these different things. And I, I pick up on that. I pick and say, That's, those are stressors. What's going to happen to the church? What's the longevity of the church? Is Pastor Goods be able to do it? Is, is the church going to come together? And even on a Thursday night, when we had a couple of people, and I'm going to be honest, it was Bishop said, hey, there's a couple of folks that are that are out sick and da 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 da. Um, he said, you know, you think we should have service? And that temptation was, well, since, and then, and then I shook it off spiritually and said, no, we will call on the name of the Lord. We will stand in the gap because I understand coming to church is not about just hearing the message, which is important. It's the, one of the highest forms of worship, but it's also about connected. Like we're all connected. We all re rely on each other. I'm like, hey, when I see you, you see me. We all, okay, you're good. Okay, you're good. It is the team. Then we have another job of praying for those who are not here. Amen. Amen. As the message is going forth and you're looking and, and a person they're visually, they're not there, but visually they're there, right? You look to the side and say, such and sit there. That's your opportunity. This is an active church. This is not a church where, oh, it's the spiritual elite versus, no. We're all growing and maturing, and the prayer warriors are here tonight, amen, not from some sense of spiritual elevation. We, uh, we have ascended uh, the greater heights. No, we are here humbly going, Lord, you gave me the grace to come here tonight. Amen. <laughs> That's why I'm here. Hallelujah. I'm weak. Amen. Can we say I'm weak? I'm weak. <laughs> I'm a weakling. I always say God always picks the scrubs and he makes them, puts them on championship teams. Amen. It's, <laughs> and, and he does it. He says, like, hey, we got the quarterback. We got, we got the best quarterback. got the best, you know, God the Father calling the, the play, the quarterback Jesus, Holy Spirit running running the <laughs> offense. I mean, you know, it, it's, and he's like, all you got to do, what's my job? Just stay there. Just stand. Just, just slow him up, you know. And he wins, and he never fails, and he never fails. Amen. And so we see the challenges. We see dwindling congregation numbers. Amen. Pastors are feeling that pressure. It's what is that? What did I share early? Demoralization campaigns and warfare. The enemy, way back in when, they would not just kill you. They would put you on a pike. 
you know, do something. Why? It wasn't just to say, oh, they so nasty. No, they did it because they were trying to make you say, I don't want to go against them. They're scary. They're going to hurt us. During the Great Crusades, a lot of that went on on both sides. It was meant to say we're tough, right? So the enemy, psychological warfare happens all the time. It's demoralization. You got something going on in your personal life, and, got, and you, are you still going to serve the Lord? Right? That's, what, that's what, the, what Satan is doing, and the Holy Spirit is going, my grace is sufficient. My grace is enough. Lord, take me out of this. And he goes, my grace is sufficient. Watch. You'll see. You'll stand. You'll keep going. You'll keep pressing. And it's a, what is that? Demonstrating the power of God. The culture and society pressures. We had pressures all around us. We have the world going, well, you know, hey, y'all can some, uh, uh, tone it down with all that spirituality. Matter of fact, have it in your church, but don't bring it out into the public sphere. And the church has conformed. Financial struggles, churches are facing that. Amen. But I know we, we you know, we're we going to keep the things. I, I, I can only imagine through the years, Bishop and Sister Peggy, ups and downs and side and side and, you know, the operational costs of running a church, even on a Thursday. It does. Many churches go, hmm, yeah, it's not worth it. If we don't have the fun. Those are pressures. Those are things that are attacking the church, attacking the church physically, attacking the church internally, amen. Um, technology challenges and stuff. We live in a digital age. We understand that people are like, hey, I'll just, you know, we, we do provide live stream, amen. And, and so we have a society. I, I would say use the technology as it's used, amen, because there are people that are immobile. There are people that, hey, I just can't get out that night. Can I watch the message later on, right? There are people in other states. we got uh, Brother Jason who, who checks us out, amen. So there's technology. Technology, the digital world, people's in their cell phone, people on their TikTok, people doing social media, and they're tuning out, and they can no longer concentrate. There's multiple studies that I've looked at, and I'm a tech person. I like tech, right? But there's multiple studies that they said screen time, television, video, cell phone, our, our attention spans. We tend to be like, squirrel. <laughs> and it's because of the because of the flicker rate of the, the screens. And then these people, some probably some devilish people know that and they put it out there. So those are challenges. You can no longer get people coming in to hear sound doctrine. I, something gotta be moving. It's gotta be moving, right? I used to say, I, I came from that. That's the indicator of the power of God. Not the fact that you're hearing the message, you're receiving the word, the word is being internalized and you're obeying the word. Not that. That's power. I always, I said that the first signs is the power to overcome sin and temptation. That is one of the, the strengths of the Holy Spirit. To have you as a Christian act Christ-like. Behave Christ-like. Talk Christ-like. Think Christ-like. The temptations, right? We were just talking about technology, technology on, on computers. People are, are falling in love all around the world now, right? Those are challenges. Um, we have youth engagement. Those are struggles that churches are starting to not be able to uh, be equipped with because, again, you're competing against all these different factors. So I'm laying it down. I, 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 there's bad news, and then I'm going to tell you about the good news. The youth... One of the things that I see that I see is that, and not just with the youth, I would say that with churches, we oftentimes forget about the fact that you were the product of someone ministering way back when, so you have a biblical foundation. We understand that there is a new generation that don't have a biblical foundation. Those are harder to reach. They're that generation Z, generation X, all these different generations. And not that it's their fault, it's that the church has not understood that we have a laid foundation. And not just give them spirituality, because that's popular. Spirituality, remember, the gurus, spiritual gurus, all the different false religions, all the uh, uh, the mixture, the, the, what I call the muddy mixture of Christianity with other false belief systems. You're seeing a lot of that, the popularizing, where people are saying, hey, I take a little bit of Christianity, and I take a little bit of Buddhism, and then I mix it, and then we call it a church. We have that challenge. We have political polarization. Um, I can go on to go on and on about that. What is that? That is basically people are being divided. They're being polarized. Democrat, Republican, Independent, Green Party, and those are stressors that are affecting the church. Within the church, I've seen people, and I came from that. I came from, well, this is what we did. This is how we voted. With no idea why. Just doing it because it's cultural. 
Doing it because, hey, they're going to give me more money. Hey, he's going to help me out. Yep. Shallow voting until you get saved and you go, whoa, now I'm voting for the kingdom of God. What, what are you going to do to advance the kingdom of God? Now that should be the question of every believer, but you're not seeing that. I've been around brothers and sisters who tell me about various issues, and they go, well, you know, I'm, I'm for this. And, and, you know, and they claim to be saved. And I'm like, you need to get saved. <laughs> for that? It, the, the, the inner works of the Holy Spirit is that you are like your Heavenly Father. He does not like sin. You no longer like sin. There was a time when you were. There was a time when I was indifferent. There was a time when I was like, oh, well, you know, to each his own. I'm not doing it. Until I'm confronted with the truth of God's word. And remember we talked about that when I first started really getting into the word. I was talking about the God is an objective God. There are absolutes in the kingdom of God. It's not wishy. It's not the muddy mixture of, well, brother, you believe what you believe, and I believe what I believe. No. We see that Jesus has an intention. Amen. I've been, we've been talking about that in Matthew, amen? Instead of reading those narratives as, that is wonderful. Look at Jesus. That is so great that he did that. He is saying, this message is for you and your generation. Amen. Applying it properly. Applying it according to the power of, the, of, of God's revealed truth. We talked about it. If the truth of God is not absolute, then we, we can shut it all down. Because then I would say the atheist is correct. All religions are pretty much the same. Worshiping a deity. I heard some guy describing it the other day. Um, I, I watched um, a Christian apologists uh, do uh, debates with atheists and other people from different worldviews. This is how I kind of learn. I, I get some great teachers, and they lay down the case for our faith. Our faith is a very solid faith. But what you have seen is a, I would say, a spiritually dumbing down of the American church. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's weak. It's, 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 it, ha, it, you know, it, it, it doesn't have the conviction. Yep. In love, there are ministers that I, I listen to, and one um, he did a lot of flack talking about, you know, hey, go to a, a homosexual wedding for my grandson. And he preaches against infidelity and adultery. And his colleagues are like, hey, and if you don't think that the battle of the enemy, the enemy is cunning. The enemy is sly. I talk about that because I'm reminded because every time I fail and fall, fell for some temptation. I'm like, man, the devil got me on that one. He will convince you about a lie by taking, by telling you a little bit of truth. Yes, yes. Because you'll hear it. God is love. A little bit of truth, and they don't balance it. He is love, and because of that love, I'm glad you brought that up, my friend. I'm glad you brought that up. He is love, and you know what he did on the cross so that you and I wouldn't have to go to hell because God is he's love, but he's also holy God, and he's a God of justice. Mm -hmm. And one sin to God, this is how we need to minister. This is how we need to engage. That doesn't come from just I heard the preacher. It comes reciting the words, reciting the message, preaching to yourself. I hope y'all preaching to yourself when you're driving um, because that's one of the best times. Get a word, start talking it. Grab a word, say, yeah. What if you had to explain that? We are, people, well, the, the Bible says don't remember anything because in due time. It's assuming certain things. It's assuming that you're studying the word. In due time, the Holy Spirit will give you what to say. As a matter of fact, it's more directed when you're persecuted. Mm -hmm. Not day to day. Can I give, I, there's been times where I've, I've been, the Bible says, rightly divide the word of truth. So, and, and it not rightly divide the word of truth, but it says, um, for, for the minister that you, and I'm paraphrasing, I don't have that, I don't want to be careful on quoting it, but I'm just going to paraphrase the fact that I need to study the word of God so that I am not ashamed. Do you know when we're ashamed on two fronts? We're ashamed when we are misquoting scripture, and we're ashamed when we go, uh, I don't know that answer. We are in spiritual warfare. We talked about that in the marks of a church, that that church, that church that Christ was talking about in Matthew chapter 18, that church knows the word. That church knows that they're on guard, right? They're not just sweet by and by, we're waiting to get to heaven. That church understands that I'm losing my grandkids. I'm losing my children. I've seen many believers, and, I, and, it, I, and it hurts my heart because there's family members, cousins, uncles, aunts. There's so many people that I'm like, I don't want them to die and go to, go to hell. 
There was a time where we all could just blur together, the lines were blurred. Now, God is making it to where there's a divided line. What do you stand for? What do you believe? Those convictions better be convictions. I'm in a politically correct biz, uh, 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 vocation. Cities, they always, these are the do's and the don'ts. Don't talk about people's this and gender. If somebody comes in and says that they're female, we all talk about that. I'm like, well, you know, it's, it's going to get a, come a time when I may not be able to work there. Mm -hmm. They literally put that in a training and said, it's so if, if, if uh, Peter come in and he says, I'm Pauline, uh, no longer do you refer to that person as that, but you, and, and so the enemy's cunning, sly. He wants us to mimic a lie. And Christians go, well, I'm going to be loving. Yes, we are loving. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. This is why the gospel has to be richly and thoroughly preached. It cannot just be watered down and I'm going to pick and pick the nice things and I'm going to leave some certain things out. Amazing grace is not amazing until you say, hey, he saved us from the wrath. And you can break it down. You don't have to use words like wrath. You can say, hey, God's the universal judge. And I'm with you, it sounds very bad, but according to the, the word of God, I had somebody come from me, what do you think about homosexuality at my job? And I was like, oh, it's a setup question, right? Because I'm supposed to be engaged with so many different people. And I said, well, I don't know about homosexuality, because that's, you know, but I can tell you this, and I went and talked about fornication, which, <laughs> which is another sort of subject to other people who were like, hey, I just sleep around with whoever, right? Mm -hmm. But I told him, I said, well, Jesus said, whoever looks at a woman to lust at him has committed that sin of adultery in their heart. And so, look, and you're right. It's either true or it's not. We will always give them that alternative. This is why I love the word of God. It's not ambiguous. It's not, it's not well, you know, there's a, a third option. No, there is this way or this way. And God has done it that way so that you can make an informed decision. So when you, if you reject the gospel, you reject it fully. It's not, well, I didn't know that was a trick question. They didn't tell me it right. No, he has always, it's always what they call, uh, uh, there's a, uh, a, a divide. There is a right or wrong. And we see that throughout all scripture. We see that balance. So moving along, we talked about mental issues. We talked about global mission and evangelism. That's starting to be under challenge. Why? Because you have places and governments and systems that are saying, no more are you allowed to pre preach the gospel. Don't bring that over here. Don't bring it in our country. There was a time when Christianity, you could come in, which was a wonderful thing. You could come in with a hospital, uh, orphanage, and all these different things. Now those companies, those countries are becoming more and more hostile to the name of Christ. And so all these challenges, um, the last one, maintaining doc doctrinal integrity and upholding biblical doctrine. That is, I would say, probably a, a thing that is... Um, it's one of those things that are sneaky because it's not so overt. And I, I shared this when you look at the, Satan's tactics is that he tells you a little bit of truth, but there's a lie in there. And we all know, and I know um, in my profession, those are things that people can get in trouble with. You tell me a little bit of truth, but you leave certain things out that's still omitting. Mm -hmm. You're omitting facts. We looked at Jesus. We looked at what he did, uh, what Satan did to Jesus, what he did to Eve. Amen. I always use those as my, and, and he's done it throughout all scripture, tricking and deceiving and lying and doing all those different things. But his intelligence, he's hyper intelligent. He knows you. He knows man. He knows, hey, I, I, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and the, the lust of the eyes. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tempt, tempt you and I'm going to attack you in those areas. And it's, it's the same game. And we, if we're not rooted in the word, word, it's easy to be deceived. I, 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 you know, I look and I say, man, how can we fight against the deception? You turn on the news, and I know certain things, but I'm like, man, he said that pretty convincingly. No, 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 no. It's for your own good. Okay, it's for my own good. Instead of going, whoa, 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 hold on, wait, let me, let me discern. And all those challenges that I was telling you about are things that are affecting the church. Those are affecting the church, and you could get, you could tend to get pretty demoralized. I was just talking about that. That's a tactic. Demoralization campaigns, misinformation campaigns. That's what we know. Know what Satan is doing, and you can tend to get depressed. I know when I'm looking at it, and, and trust me, you know, it, it is kind of like, oh, where's everybody at, right? But 
Our focus has to be on the Lord. We were talking about that tonight. We were singing about that tonight because it doesn't matter what you see by faith. What does his word say? And what does he say about the matter? And that's what we're going to go in tonight talking about the vision of the church. So we have all these outside influences. We have all these problems and issues. And despite that, Jesus says, I have a plan for the church. I'm doing something in the church. And when we know that, when we know his plan, when we know what he, Lord, what do you want for us, right? Just like you're here tonight because you know the plan. You know how vital and how crucial his will, right? His will, not the world's will, not even your own personal will. When we know that, it gives us encouragement. This is where, I re where we rejoice. I'm going to open up with the first scripture. It's going to, and I'm going to, it's Revelation chapter 1. We're not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to give you a synopsis breakdown. This is where we, the first thing we're going to talk about, that Jesus has a vision for his church. We saw it in the book of Revelation. We saw it with the, uh, with the apostle John as he's sitting there. You, can, you want to talk about the press. You want to talk about the press. He was there when Jesus said, I'm going to be coming back. you got to believe that during that time, the apostles didn't all think that they were going to die. They thought Jesus said he's leaving and he's going to come back. So you can imagine some people that may be a little bit depressed, may be a little bit down in the dumps, amen, but yet God uh, 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 found it worthy to show him this vision. He shared with him this vision. In the book of uh, Revelation chapter 1, we understand that it opens up um, chapter 1, chapter 1, verse 1. I'm going to just give you a synopsis of it because there's a lot there, amen, and then we have some other scriptures we're going to get through. So it says um, in this opening chapter of the book. Um, in the New Testament, John the author introduces himself and sets the stage for this prophetic vision. So we know John the Revelator, he's on the island of Patmos. This island was a small island. It was an outcast island. It was a prison island. It was fit for yourself. You better believe there were some ruffians. Amen. He was put there because why? Because he was preaching the gospel. He was preaching the gospel. He was doing the right thing and being punished. And, and so the, the world system said, we told you stop preaching that Jesus. We're going to exile you to this island. During that time, and, and John talks about it was on that day when I was, I was in the spirit. He was connected with God. And it tells us something. It tells us that even in that type of pressure, even when that type of dis devastation, because as I'm reading this and I'm going, that would, have, that would make you depressed. It would make you say, "Just let's just all give up and go home. It reminded me about the challenges that are facing the church today. It reminds me about the, the, what bishops through the years have always, a, a pastor always is burdening for his congregation. When you hurt, he hurts. When he hears bad news or a loss in your family, it's his. It's not, oh, well, you know, that's not me. I've seen that through the years. I've seen it through the years where I'm like, man, how do you take on all of that? And it's very important, what I'm sharing with you tonight, it's very important for you to be rooted in Christ, to understand that, God, you're in control. Just like I have to say that. Just like if one person shows up, if two people show up, I have to say, Lord, you're in control. You are the author of the church. You are the author and finisher of our life. Amen. And my prayer, because I've been well trained, my prayer is to pray the spirit of God to draw the saints to the congregation. Amen. To also encourage. Amen. We're going to be doing those things as well. We, we, we're going to get back to reaching out and calling people and reminding, amen, because sometimes the problem about it is that you may be in, a person may be in a position of oppression and depression that they need spiritual help. Amen. It is, it's not going to just osmosis. It's not going to just, I, you know, they're they going to feel it and they're going to come. Yes, that works, but guess what? You play a vital role in that. When we pray, when we link up on Tuesday, we're linking up and we're doing that on purpose, amen, to, to one, build up our spiritual knowledge about the things of God. Because once we know the will of God, we know how to specifically pray. We know how to target our prayers. We talked about the fact of revival. So, so what does that remind me? Hey, pray for revival, revival in the soul, revival in the spiritual life, amen. It, it can mean a dead person turning back to life, amen, a person that's a sinner to a Christian, but it also means that throughout our Christian walk, we need those revivals. We need to be stirred up. We need to have someone speak a word from the word that gives us strength and power that makes us go, yeah, yeah, that's who I am. I'm the righteousness in Christ Jesus. That may seem like nothing, but that is a powerful thing because we need to be reminded that because Satan wants to tell you that, hey, you messed up yesterday. 
Yeah. You have to say, I'm the righteous in Christ Jesus. Yeah, that would affect me if, if, my, if it was bent on my righteousness. If I had to earn my way to heaven, I couldn't make it. You're right. The accuser can tell me that, but I can say, it's not by me. It's not by my might, but it's by the spirit of the Lord. So John is here. He has his prophetic vision. It begins with a great greeting of the seven churches. We talked about that from Asia. The blessings to those who read the book and heeding to the prophecy. We talked about that um, in previous lessons as well because there's a special blessing to that. And people go, ooh, Revelation is crazy. It's whacked out. you got to understand it. It's easy to understand if you understand it. There's a structure to it. There are literary things that, that it uses, devices that it uses, but it's understandable. You use a concordance. You also, you also just knowing some background of what's going on. Like I had to study about John, just understanding like, hey, so where, where was he at again? He was in a bad place. And if any one of us is going like, he's in prison and he's gone through all this. Oh man, he must have did something really bad. No, sometimes you're going through because that is, that is where God has you. And we need to minister that to people. People are in very difficult places. There's been times where I'm like, people are like, what did you tell them? I, I, I'm, one of my jobs is, is to do notifications. Do not like it. Never get used to it. It's like you ambush people. Hey, um, are you, uh, da, 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 you know such and such? Mm -hmm. And you see their eyes like deers. And you got to tell them, hey, we um, got called out to a scene, blah, 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 blah. And I mean, and so what do you do? Be there for them. Stand there with them. It's not, oh, well, you know, good luck, see you later. No, it's ministering. That is why we were created. That's why we were saved, amen? God says, this is not just your vocation. This is a ministry. Understand that. When you understand that, you're connected with it, and you understand that it's not just, hey, next call, please. No, it's, this is God. This is why I was, I was brought here tonight. And that's what each and every one of us need to realize as we come to church, understanding the purpose. Because it can be a point, and I say this, be on guard for apathy. Be on guard for, hmm, that's a dangerous position. Because you may not come back. You may not, it may be so where you're just, you're, you're cold to the spiritual thing. It can do nothing for you. It, it's called inoculation. People who are, are given a virus shot and they're inoculated and then they get that, it, it, it's worse. And that happens spiritually. You hear the gospel. Matter of fact, the word of God tells us about those type of individuals. They hear the gospel. There's no other sacrifice for you. This is, I would tell, I would say that's probably the number one thing that is affecting and, and, and um, people are disillusioned. I, I, I followed and stuff started happening and how could God allow this? Now they may not say it, but they show it. Depression is real. It's a real enemy. We don't want to go, oh, well, that's them. They should have better faith. No, it's demonic oppression. It is influence from the world, and it's also the flesh. The all in nature that you still, unfortunately, have with you until you go on to be with God in glory. Amen. Amen. This chapter vividly describes a vision of Jesus Christ and his glory. Now, this is important because we understand this is Jesus speaking. This is him saying, hey, I was humble as a child. Then I, I was revealed in Old Testament. I was humbled as a child. And then revelation, now I'm glorified. So now you're getting a, a real sense of Christ. This is why it's important not to just say, hey, oh, way in a manger, right? That's a step in a transition. Even on the cross, the cross did everything, right? It was our access to the Father, but we do not want to forget that he is glorified. Amen. He is king. He is Lord. He deserves our attention. He deserves the attention of our mind. Amen. Alex, keep me on point on time, please. Okay, thank you. Because I can always, I, I'm, I'm learning, even as I prepare my messages, amen. Hey, I, we don't have to, we don't have to, have to eat the whole steak at one sitting, right? It's, it's building brick by brick. I'd rather have brick by brick than to try to say, hey guys, real quick, in one hour, we're going to try to build a castle, right? I'd rather do it, take a different approach, so that way you can get it down and, um, and, and receive from the Lord. Amen. So he's, he talks about that. He's emphasizing the glory of God. And I want you to understand that that is very important. And Revelation is setting the stage of the fact that Christ is coming back. That 
that is where we start going. We don't get depressed about it. We don't go, what's going on in the church? Man, is everything going to be all right? Man, we got these transitions happening in our church. Trust me, it happens to me. It creeps in my mind. But I'm reminded about the word. I'm reminded about the faithfulness. I'm reminded about the apostles when the apostles went through different things. I'm reminded about what Paul spoke to Timothy, right? Because Bishop has spoken those things, those very words to me. And where does my strength come from? From the Lord. It does not come from I, I'm the best speaker. There might be other people better speakers than me. It's obedience. You and I, it's obedience. Tonight, what is on display, make no mistake about it, is the obedience to Christ that you exhibit. The fact that you are coming on a Thursday when you didn't really have to. You could have been somewhere else. You could have made an excuse. Hey, and, and, and you might have a legitimate excuse. Don't get me wrong. I always, always like to qualify because I don't want anybody to misconstrue and say, oh, well, what, what, what if this happens? What if that happens? We're, we're, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when you can make it. I'm talking about when that extra push, that extra uh, uh, defeating. Are we defeating the flesh? I always tell people, you have victory over the flesh. The mere fact that you can get that flesh and say, hey, make it on Thursday night. On Thursday night? Yes, it's a little chilly. On, on a chilly Thursday night, too? <laughs> and you made it? The vision... That Jesus, that that uh, that John was talking about, was to reassure believers of Christ's sovereign control. That is very important. When we are hearing this message, as we are hearing the message, and it started with the glorious praise and worship that we were able to give to our God. And I say able because when you think about that, that's a blessing. You're like, Lord, I'm not laying in a hospital bed or or not on life support, right? I'm able to worship you. I get excited about that. Oh Lord, I thank you for waking me up. Thank you for bringing me here today. Thank you for protecting me in my, my drive. Thank you for, and go down the line, and you will find that when you see God high and lifted up, it will explode into more and more praise and worship, amen. And you will be that saint that is impressed with the things of God. You're impressed with the word of God. The word of God can teach you something, amen. When I'm hearing the word, he's normally, bishops preaching out of certain messages that, or uh, Bible verses that I'm like, oh yeah, I was in that the other day, right? I stop that. God is not impressed with that. God's like, are you obeying it? Are you listening? Are you held accountable to that same message? Amen. So that's what he's talking about. In summary of this, it says the importance to understand. And again, I did this because we would, I can preach on that by itself because it, it's a reminder about the glory of God. It's the reminder about the glory of Christ and his soon return and his power and his authority. It is meant to stir us up. It's meant to get, shake us out of the, what's going on in the church? God has it under control. Jesus said, I have it under control. My church is going to be my church. Those that are for real, are going to be within my church. Those that are standing at the at the last call will be in my church. So so he's telling and, and for pastors because we tend to want to be the fix it alls. And I know his, I know his temptation, my temptation. We want to fix everything. And, and God says, I, I'm the Lord of the church. I can relax. I can say, Oh, all I got to do is execute the plan. I just got to execute the play. Let me read one Bible verse. We're going to go into talking about a second point because we talked about Christ as a vision. That vision was revealed in Revelation. He said, hey, I'm going to talk about the seven churches. I'm going to talk about the ones that were doing right and those that were not doing it right. Amen. So we're going to go uh, the feelings of, Je of Jesus among us. Amen. So Jesus has a certain attitude towards us. Understanding how Jesus is actively involved in our church life. That is very important for us to get, it, get get our minds wrapped around. We have to understand that he's active. I don't see him. Where is he at? I thought it was just us doing it. No. When we are in his word and obeying and executing what he wants for his church, he wants disciples. That's one of the things that, the, the things that I started realizing that many Christians are, are not aware of that. The importance of church, uh, being a part of a church. The importance of being under, a, being a disciple within a church. We're, we're gone of those days. Now churches are so pragmatic that they're like, oh, we don't want to put any pressure on them. When in fact, Jesus said, no, you are to create disciplined followers. Those that are Christ-like. We don't just go, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, everybody's a Christian, right? No, it is, are you a Christ-like disciplined follower? That is where, where the separation happens, amen? And so, the book of Revelation chapter 13, amen, that we were just in, and it says, Christ among, amongst the lamps, 
lamp stands. In Revelation, um, Burke, can you uh, turn to uh, verse 13? This is going to be my last one for this evening. Revelation 13, 13? No, uh, yeah, one thirteen. I'm sorry. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. And it says, And in the middle of the lampstand I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching uh, a robe reaching to his feet, and gird across his chest was a golden sash. This here, saints, is talking about the fact that Christ is, he's standing, Paul, I remember John is having this revelation, he's, he's looking up to heaven, he's seeing the, this picture, God is giving him that, Jesus has given him that, that vision, he's in heaven, he's like, oh wow, and he's describing the fact that Christ is active, that his presence is active in our ministry, we need to understand that within the true church. Amen, because not we live in a world that you, you're going to have to define, what do you mean by church? Like, because I'm going to be honest, the Jehovah's Witness said that they have church. Uh, the, you have the Mormons have a church. You have the church of Satan, right? I mean, what do you mean by that? What, what, or is it a Christ-centered church? Is it a church that proclaims the name of Christ? Is Jesus the Lord over that church? Yeah, we're past that. We're more into this. We have to, we're getting to a point where we have to distinguish. And sad to say, Many Christians don't understand that. So it's like indistinguishable. But thank God for his word. We see right here, this is a representation of him saying, I'm in the midst of my church. That is number one. We're going to end off with that. We, I went in and gave you a breakdown from Revelation just so that we can recap what was actually going on. What Matter of fact, the mindset of John, the, he, he had to be like, oh, this doesn't look good. And Jesus, hey, I thought you said you were coming back, right? You want to talk about dissolution, but yet he stayed faithful. Yet each one of the apostles were, were died. The blood of the, of the apostles paved the way for us to, to have the word of God that we have today. And many yeah. people forget about that. It was by blood. And people say, well, they were lying. People, it's one thing of not knowing that something's a lie and dying for it, but to know it's a lie and dying for it, you're not likely to do that. That is one of the arguments that atheists, worldly people say, oh, they just made it up. This is not, they didn't have the internet society. This wasn't a TikTok society. These men did, wasn't trying to be famous. Because if you're in front of people and they're about to put you to death, all you had to do was renounce, renounce them. Okay, okay, it was, a, it was a lie. We hid his body. They went to their deaths. And this is why I want to tell people when they go, you make, I'm an apostle, I'm a this. I'm like, you're not the uh, capital A apostles because they died. John died. He was on. Yes, he didn't die quickly, but I mean, that was a terrible death. Yeah. Starving. Fighting for your survival. Because that island was filled with other uh, killers, murderers. It was, it was an exile island. So remember that. Our faith comes with a price. And, our, and as we worship him tonight, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message, Lord, as we are, are hearing that you are in control, Lord. We can walk away tonight understanding that, God, you have a plan and all we have to do is be faithful. God, you're looking for those that are faithful, those that are standing, Lord, and not backing away, not shrinking, not fainting, Lord, because of the pressures, Lord. Yes, those pressures are real. But we understand that you are in control. We can glorify your name. We can lift you up, Lord, and we can see you as the as, as John, the revelator, saw you. He saw that, God, you're in control. That gave him the peace. That gave him the comfort to know that you are in control of your church. It is not going by the, 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 by the wayside, Lord. You are in control. You are the God that is guiding and Lord, we know from your word, we have the answers to the test. We see it in Revelation. We see it in the New Testament, what's going to happen and, and how it's going to happen, God. And I just thank you for that tonight. I thank you for the, the praise and worship of the saints, God. We understand as a, as a ministry, we take that serious. We understand that praise and worship lifts you up, Lord. And it reminds us about your grandness. It reminds us about how powerful you are. And it reminds us. That you are still the God that is delivering. You're still the God that is healing. If we are to pray, if we seek your face in, with all humility, with all love for the saints, God, that your will will be done in this church and in this ministry. And I just pray, to God, that you are glorified with of my brothers and sisters, those who were not able to make it. I pray that, Lord, that you will give them by the power of your spirit, Lord, that conviction. If it needs, if they need to be convicted, Lord, or it may be, Lord, that they are they are shut in, Lord, because of sickness. And I pray. 
pray that any boundaries, anything that is weighing them down, God, that that would be removed. I pray, God, that, you, that your will will be their will. Lord, just like it was for us here tonight, God, we, we're nothing special. We're not super saints, Lord. We're just walking by faith, and we're allowing the power of your spirit. True anointing, God, is to overcome the flesh. It's to be obedient. It's to live a life of love. It's to live a life of Christ-likeness. And we just thank you for everything. I pray for the safety and protection of my brothers and sisters. I pray for those that are in the hospital. The little baby, Lord, that is seven years old, that is sick with cancer. We pray on, on her on. Uh, her behalf. We stand in the cap, God. Lord, there are things that are out of our control, Lord. We're not the doctors, but I pray that you will give the doctors wisdom. You will give them a pathway to her healing, Lord. You will reveal to them what to do and how to treat the baby, Lord. And I just pray for the family. I pray for salvation. If they don't know you, that they will know you, God. That they will be drawn to you by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. amen. Let's go serve our king. Let's give God the glory. And let's just continue lifting each other up. Amen. What we're doing is building that foundation. It's step by step. It's brick by brick. Amen. And I, I believe that we're going to see that transformation, especially within, I will say this, pray for our youth that we will reproduce Christianity. If we lose our youth, and this is one of the tactics of the enemy. Amen. God just laid this on my heart. This is an attack, a playbook from the enemy. I'll take your youth out and that will decimate your numbers. But we pray differently. We say, God, I pray that you would draw them, that you would reveal yourself, that the scales of Satan and hell would be removed from their eyes. Amen. And let's keep that. Let's keep that moving forward, saints. We'll see y'all on uh, Sunday. Praise God. Um, again, we need those prayers because we know folks are sick and we want to see people coming into church and learning and being built up. Amen. See y'all later.